been called Miss in a while. <laughs> you, you must miss me already. Okay. Um, uh, I have a little thing that I'm going to be doing, which is standing up and sitting down. I led my students on a January term trip to um, the um, Camino de Santiago. And yeah, awesome, right? That's what we do in Hampshire, awesome things. But um, I hurt my foot on the first day. But whoops, it was a pilgrimage, so 100 miles later, uh, I decided to, to stop walking because I was done, and it wasn't good for my foot, so I've been healing since January. So I need to sit down sometimes. Uh, but I know that after I sat here in a while, that I'm not going to be able to really sit down because I'm not a kind of sit down kind of person. So I'm going to kind of bounce up and down. But so but first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put my Crocs on because I can't wear these shoes if I stand up. So I'm going to put my Crocs on. But I'm going to swear you all to secrecy. Okay, you ready? My daughter gave me these Crocs when she was a teenager. Because I love Crocs, they're great, you know, camp shoes and stuff. She gave me these Crocs when I was a teenager, and she, there was a little note in them that said, Mom, if you ever wear these in public, <laughs> I'm going to disown you, okay? <laughs> so not only am I wearing them in public, and I try to keep that. Not only am I wearing them in public, I'm wearing them in public when I do a keynote address, okay? <laughs> do not tell her. Okay, so I'm going to put those on. So the metaphor here is I want you to get comfortable because I'm going to get comfortable. So just kind of get comfortable. If you need to go to the bathroom or anything, please do that. Whatever you need to do. We like that. Um, they're not even, you thought they were going to be fluorescent, didn't you? <laughs> they're not. They're blue. <laughs> they match my outfit. Um, so get comfortable. But what I want to tell you is I don't want you to stay comfortable. Because when I finish here, if you're still comfortable, I haven't done my job. How many of you in your programs have heard of this idea of safe space? How many in your programs you actually use that idea of safe space? Huh? Yeah. Oh, I do too. What I want to do, what I have done in my whole life with, in terms of social justice, is unpack some of these ideas. And that's what we're going to do today is unpack a lot of stuff. Okay? So I want to um, say safe space is great. That's what we try to do. Um, oftentimes in our programs, make this, make sure this works. No, I can't make anything go. I'm going to have to do it the old-fashioned way. Does that work? Okay. Oh, I'm going to have to get near my, my projector. Okay. So we use safe space. I'm still going to believe I can use this. Nope. Ah. Oops. 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 Sorry. So I'm going to introduce you the idea of brave space. And it's a concept that's starting to get into the social justice stuff, just a little tiny bit. But it's the idea with social justice that, that safe space may not be realistic. It may not even be appropriate. Because what it is is that if we really embrace social justice in our programs and teaching about it and learning about it and, and grappling with it, that there's going to be conflict, that it's going to be messy, that it's going to be uncomfortable. Okay. And, and I would even suggest that the idea of safe space is a pretty privileged concept. Because people with power get to define what is safe and what's safe from them. And so we often see that in our programs. Who, decide, who decided what was safe? 
So I, I urge you to embrace this idea of brave space, where you take courage, where you have courage to take risks, where you, where you, uh, it still has some of the, it still has a lot of the components of safe space, because you still want to respect people and all those things, but you want to be able to be co courageous, and you want to be able to be able to sit with feelings that are uncomfortable and act on them. Okay? So, we're there? All right. So I want to tell you a little bit about my history, just so, so you know that I'm not just sitting up here um, going oops a lot. Because I came to Hampshire in 1983, uh, and there was an ongoing outdoor orientation program. It started in 1974. How many, I know besides Dartmouth, how many programs here were older than that? Yes, you, yeah, 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 okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll even say we were earlier then. No. Uh, uh, so in 1974, then when I came in 1983, we had a nice little 15 uh, groups in the wilderness kind of program. Well, it got, it progressed and progressed, and pretty soon, um, when I came, actually there were seven, then pretty soon there was 15, because it was popular, and it was a pre-college, a pre-orientation thing. And then at one point, the president decided it was such a good idea that we would just do the whole school. And so then we became orientation. Well, we were really good at leading outdoor trips. We weren't so good at being orientation because what it meant is that we had 15 trips in the, in the wilderness and we had 15 trips on campus um, doing, oh, geez. And uh, so there's, my, there's one of my orientation groups doing things like blacksmithing and dance and things that we weren't. About 10 years ago, we lost our program. And this is relevant to what Brett was say, um, saying in terms of the research. And because some of the reasons we lost our program, so we no longer, after all those years where we had this super successful program, we lost, a key, we lost key administrators, but we lost them all along. We'd have deans and we'd have to re, you know, educate the deans and that. that. Um, we didn't reach out as much as we could to other departments and other things, so that was a problem. Um, but one of the key problems is that the idea that Brent was talking about is people being jealous of you, okay? And it wasn't in our case so much as jealous as this, this idea that what we were doing wasn't the way the, it was kind of old school, it wasn't the way the college was going. This Hampshire College, if anybody's aware of Hampshire College, it's, it's a, a very progressive liberal arts college, okay? And so um, they hired a new orientation director, and what he believed is that you really couldn't do social justice on these trips. Um, and so we needed a different model for that. And so he came in and introduced a different model, which is basically orientation and talking heads and um, those sorts of things. Um, and, and he's since become a friend of mine. But why he believed that you couldn't do social justice on, on, in the outdoors was because of some of the entrenched paradigms that we have in outdoor adventure. And that's where my research has been um, well, my whole life, but more of late, my doctoral research, was on looking at what I call paradigms of outdoor adventure. Okay? Um, because, yeah. There they are. Because in, in order to unpack what we're doing on the ground, and lots of um, students always come up to me and say, I'm really, really interested in, in social justice. I really want to do this on our trips. How do we do it? Okay? And I believe, and I'll tell any student I work with, that theory and practice must go hand in hand, okay? So if, we're, if, we, if, you, if you ask me for activities of how to do it, social justice, I can tell you lots of them, okay? Lots of them that I've stolen, that I've developed, that I've you know, seen over the years. But the point is, until I can unpack some of the theory, I, those, those activities are foundless. And for, for you that study experiential education, you know that's true, right? Say yes, because that's that's a good answer. <laughs> you know, you have to ha there has to be some theory behind your practice. Okay. So, paradigms. Uh, paradigms. What are paradigms? I'm still going to believe I can do this. This is like wishful thinking. Is this the dream machine? <laughs> still believe that's going to work. <laughs> okay. Paradigms and paradigm shifts. So, um, let's see. A 
paradigm is, oh, I don't have it today. Yeah. Paradigms. Okay, no. <laughs> All right, Scott. Scott. Scott's the only one in this room that's ha Scott's the only one in this room is happy we lost our orientation program because every fall he comes over to Hampshire and goes, "Can I borrow about ten thousand dollars worth of equipment that we have?" And and so uh, we we do. Uh, they are grateful because <laughs> we don't use it anymore, right? It might be that these things have a. Uh, a shelf life? Oh, here, we'll use yours. Oh, yours is the same one. Keyboard set up, though. Oh, uh, maybe not. <laughs> oh, maybe not. Let's see. There you go. Is this industry standard? Yes. Okay, so what is a paradigm shift? Yay! It even fits, my, it's the same one, it fits my hand. It's so comfortable. Uh, so the chicken. Chicken in, it, it, the chicken's world, her world, is the inside of an egg for so, so long. But if enough cracks get into an idea, boom, the idea exp, exp, is exploded. And that's, what, that's a paradigm shift besides those two dimes. Okay, everybody got that? Um, so what are these paradigms of outdoor adventure? The first one I'll talk about is the paradigm of diversity. So Luis Yesco calls this paradigm, or this this idea of diversity as the Crayola crayon box. And that is the idea that there's all these colors in this crayon box, right? Um, there's bird sienna and there's, you know, magenta and all that. There's uh, creamsicle, those, those colors. But the point of, of diversity is that creamsicle is not, doesn't have any more power than magenta. And and burnt sienna doesn't have any more power in the crayon box as um, lime, okay? But in our society, that's not true. But with diversity, oftentimes we look at it that way. And so what in our programs, in our outdoor programs, what we often do is what I call, is what, what Chavez, Chavez calls the eye triad, which is we invite people of difference into our programs. Anybody have programs that you, it's like, can we get more, more X into our programs? Anybody have that? Okay. Yeah. We want to get more, more, more people of color. We want to get more um, women into our program. We want to get more queer people into our program. Whatever. We want to get more X people into our program. So that's the invite thing. Um, <clears throat> we also want to include them. In other words, uh, make them have power within that. And then also involve them, and so have them uh, people of difference at higher levels of, of, of problem solving, decision making, and those sorts of things. What I would suggest to you, based on what I my research, is that we're in the invite model in outdoor programming. We've spent a lot of time inviting people into our programs without changing our programs. So what happens is we invite them in, they look around, they go, oops, no one like me, oops, this isn't, isn't part of my culture, oops, this isn't, oh, I'm using oops, uh, oops, this isn't, <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't what I do, this isn't me. And then, and, then, and then they leave, okay? And so then we have to go back and invite some more, all right? And what we haven't learned to do really well in outdoor adventure is involve and include. We haven't learned how to co-create programming with marginalized communities. Okay? And I'll talk about that later. How do we co-create? Um, okay. The next paradigm I'm going to talk about is the, is the paradigm of wilderness adventure. Pretty pictures? Which one do you like more? If you had a favorite, would you like this? this ah. That works too. Would you like this nice picture that I took in Chesler Park and Canyonlands? Yeah. Or would you like this nice park bench that I took along the Suwannee River in Georgia? How, many's go, how many go in that way? Canyonlands. Okay. And how many go in this way? Okay. Hmm. Wow. They're both pretty. It was, they were both beautiful. Okay. Um, but what we, what, what, we have, what we often have done in outdoor adventure is, and this is the whole hi history of recreation, the history of leisure, and the history of wilderness. And that is predicated on the idea of what we value is the sublime, which is the beauty, the great cathedrals of, 
of Yellowstone, I mean of um, that other place, Yosemite. Uh, <laughs> ah, you've seen one, you've seen them all. Um, <laughs> Got, I'm glad I got my cracks on. Um, the great cathedrals of, of um, Yosemite are, are part of our history, are part of what resonates with us, okay? Versus the utilitarian, which is the actual use of wilderness, okay? And if we think about it, so this whole sublime wilderness thing, and it actually came from a European construct, which, you know, when John Muir came, he said, oh, these are the cathedrals of Yosemite, Okay, and that European construct um, was because we have cathedrals that are as good as Europe. So it's like, you know, we're as good as Europe. So, so what we have in the United States is wilderness. Okay, but remember, if you've taken the class, was the wilderness say? Nobody's taking the class. Okay, yeah. What? Yeah, untrampled by man, but. We'll let that one go now. Um, untrampled, remote, okay? So the idea of wilderness is about remoteness. But what we know is that uh, people from marginalized communities, the idea of remoteness may be pretty scary because that's where things that, um, that are uh, violent, things that are, um, are scary, things that are fearful, happen, okay? And the, versus the utilitarian, where oftentimes com particular communities of color, indigenous communities, actually use the land in a way that is really not sublime. Okay? It's about use. Um, and so, but oftentimes in our venture programs, we are caught in the sublime concept. All right? I wasn't going to go here, but think about leave no trace. Yeah? You thinking about it? <laughs> Good. <laughs> they, uh, I'm all about leave no I'm a trainer, okay? I'm not, you know, and all of these things, whatever I say, I'm trying to make you feel uncomfortable. I'm trying to make you think. I'm trying to make you be critical thinkers and unpack this stuff, okay? I'm not saying get rid of leave no trace. Like I said, I'm a trainer, okay? But you think about it, what does that mean? We're, we, we are so good and leave no trace, we will not even touch or leave any part of human existence in the outdoors. Okay? That's a sublime version of it. And it's really pretty a privileged concept, um, or based on a privileged concept. I'm not saying go throw a litter. Okay? But I want you to think about some of these things. Okay. So anyway, um, most people see me as an academic, a person who's, I'm a practitioner because I'm always out with students in the outdoors. I was just out yesterday canoeing with them. Um, uh, you know, I teach all these classes in the outdoors, so I'm in the outdoors a lot, okay? So, but what people don't know about me is I am a very big basketball fan. <laughs> in fact, Brent asked me to come up, or said, uh, you know, you come up last night, but I had to stay home and watch the WNBA draft. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to do the March Madness of Wilderness Adventure, just to kind of get this concept into you. The March Madness of Wilderness Adventure. Okay, so up here I have this park, and these are just places I've been. So here's this beautiful little park with a little nice little pond in it, and versus, uh, and so these are going to be brackets. The brackets slipped off the slide for some reason, but there's going to be brackets. And so then we have the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone, right? Okay, so if I have to choose between those two things, I'll tell you what I choose. I don't know if it's, you're going to be different, but I, I'm going to choose Yellowstone, okay? So then I have my bottom brackets here, okay? So I'm just doing my, we're at the final four. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> we don't have enough time to do my whole brackets. Okay, so uh, right here I have this really nice picnic table I said, you know, big picnic table fits whole families of people around it versus this, so these are lunch spots, so that's a nice lunch spot. And this is an island in the Bahamas that we take students to see kayaking, and so here's our lunch spot in the Bahamas, okay? So on uh, this one, just because of the more remoteness, I'm going to choose, the first one it was more grandeur, but this one I'm going to choose um, the island, okay, because it's remote. A good choice? Okay. So then I have down to the final game here, and it's Yellowstone and the island, okay? So the island is remote, but there's not monumental beauty to it, you know? 
So I'm going to choose Yellowstone. Okay? <clears throat> and I won. <laughs> and I got drafted. Um, <laughs> but what do we know about, the, so what's the problem with having these very embedded kind, ways of thinking about the outdoors or about uh, wilderness or about, you know, um, adventure? One of those is there's access problems. Historically, um, access has been dependent on resources um, to get there, money to buy the specialized gear, um, and access to real uh, leisure time, which is a class issue, right? So Jory was telling me this morning about this program is really long and it, it's kind of expensive, but you know, the real issue is not necessarily the expense, because you can deal with that, but it's that people have to leave their summer jobs for a while. Um, to do that. So, so there's, some, there's access issues. Uh, so, you know, I find it interesting when I, when I see, see programs and they say, we're open to everybody. You know, come, come to our program, come to our beginning backpacking program, we're open to everyone. Um, except you have to bring a backpack, hiking boots, a sleeping bag, a pad, and, you know, your specialized clothes. Um, and so, you know, thinking about it and unpacking some of those things, uh, you know, if that's the case, don't say they're open to everyone, because they're really not, okay? unless you can help them be open to everyone. All right, the paradigm of individualism. <clears throat> um, it's predicated on this whole idea, if you're familiar with Kurt Hahn, the whole idea of self-reliance. And when Outward Bound came here, this whole you know, we're going to do it ourselves, and the rugged individuals, which is really a U.S. cultural value as well. I'm not just, I'm not just blaming Kurt Hahn. <laughs> uh, so, but what, so, you know, where do we get those messages? We get those messages, you know? So here's, here's the into the wild guy, you know? Uh, here's um, the guy that has to cut off his arm in order to save himself, right? A hero, he was a hero. You know, he did that, he was a hero, okay? And, you know, the solitary conquest of conquest or conquering of, of, Yellow, or of Yellowstone, I'm back to Yellowstone, of Everest, okay? So we have these, these very bold images of individualism in, in outdoor adventure. And they do, like messages of anything, race, class, and gender, these images of, of, of uh, um, outdoor adventure follow us. That's who they followed our orientation director. It wasn't his fault, he thought, we couldn't do social justice. It was these images that helped him to maintain some of those ideas. But what we know about individualism is that people of color and people of marginalized communities often recreate together. Uh, I was talking to Adam about this. Uh, we were, you know, the Park Service is starting to realize that how they have set up their parks is not really advantageous to people of color, for example. You know, the, 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 if the research says that Hispanic people um, want to recreate with their families, they need to build bigger picnic tables and picnic tables in groups rather than these solitary picnic tables here, okay? And how we, you know, how we do some of those things. Now, picnic tables may not be your responsibility, but I just want you to think about some of these things, okay? And then, uh, you know, um, oppressed communities rely on each other for cooperation and survival. This is an outdoor access event that I do with my students. So there's this whole thing of community being a concept often of oppressed groups because you have to be in community in order to survive versus this whole um, paradigm of individualism, okay? So, since reflection's always good in these things, I want to invite you, if you're comfortable, to close your eyes for a minute. And while you're closing your eyes, I want you to think of some aspect of your program that uh, fits into one of these paradigms I've talked about. Okay, you can come join me again. Okay, um, and what I would like you to do with that, <clears throat> not right now, but later on today, I want you to talk with someone else about what that meant as a way of, of, of doing a reflection publicly, okay? So we're gonna go on to. To the right clicker. 
I'm just going to get all my laughs from the clicker. Uh, now what? So what do we do with this? So if we're thinking about how we do this cultural thing and this theory, I would su suggest to you that the personal is political. If these are what we believe about outdoor adventure, then in order to act, we need to um, uh, have intention first. My, one of my favorite quotes. So we need to act. And when, when, when <clears throat> Alice Walker is talking about activism, she might not be talking about those people that are marching. Okay? The, the purest form of activism is education and leadership. And you all have that potential to do that. Okay. So I want to talk just a minute So in terms of what now. One of the things that in order to, to, to recognize this, we need to recognize what it is on a cultural level, and that's what I did with the, the paradigms. Now I want you to look at it just a little bit on a personal level. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about privilege, just for, just for us for Privilege 101. This is... Of course, Peggy McIntosh's classic view of privilege. Yeah. I'm taking, talking about all kinds of education. Yeah, yeah. You know, parenting is education. Uh, you know, political speeches are education. <laughs> I guess that's relevant right now. Eh? Um, okay. So it's an invisible. So I wanted to show you um, my um, backpack of privilege. But I have to, where did I put it? Did anybody see it? It's black. It's not that blue one. It's a black one. Did you, did you see it? I'm wearing it? I don't see it. I really don't see it on my back, so it must be somewhere else. Come on, do you see it? Do you see it? Do you see it? Do you see it? How come I can't see it? I'm wearing it. I'm wearing my vest. Somebody come up here and help me out. Because I really don't see it. Yeah? Oh, strip. Oh, here it is. Yay. All right. Well, let me unpack it while I'm here since we've, we're looking at it. just wear every day okay <laughs> so this um this is my actually my backpack i brought my backpack of white privilege today okay so this is my backpack of white privilege and so um so i'm thinking about going on a nice outdoor course uh anyone this could be outdoor course 101 <laughs> didn't really say Knowles, okay and i'm not holding Knowles up for, for this because Knowles has done some significant really important work uh, on social justice. Anyway, um, <coughs> we won't have to defend them. Um, anyway, so when I think about going on, a, on an outdoor course, I am pretty sure that I'll encounter people of my own race on that course. And in fact, if I look through the brochure, if I open it, to open it, I'm pretty sure that I'll see people of my race in the brochure. Okay. When I, um, when I decide to go on the course, and I decide that I can pay for it, if I give them a check, which I know you don't use anymore, but if I gave my debit card, I can be pretty sure that um, my method of payment would not be questioned because of my race. Okay? I can pick up one of my favorite, now obsolete, magazines, and pr be pretty sure if I go through here, I'll see people of my race. Pretty sure. If I go out on the trail in the White Mountains, I know when I'm setting out that if I come across people, I'm pretty sure that, some, that somebody will be of my race. I have that assurance. I just, you know, it just happened. This, you saw me in that slide. That slide was probably like 20 years ago, right? So... I still, I still use it. Uh, so if I use the, if I have this really piece of shoddy outdoor equipment, dirty and everything, I'm pretty sure that pe if people judge me about it, they won't be judging me because of my race. And 
Let's see. I'm pretty sure that if I go my first aid kit and I get out a Band-Aid, it'll match my skin color because it's flesh colored. Okay? And uh, the flutes, the flutes for later, remind me if I forget to, I'm going to play you a social justice tune. Okay? And I'm pretty sure, what else do I have here? There are only a few more things. I'm pretty sure that um, if I go on one of those courses, that I will be served food that comes from my, my culture. Um, and, you know, it'll be good. And I'm pretty sure that if I pick up my outdoor leadership textbook, and bring the whole thing, they're heavy, um, <laughs> that uh, I will see people of my race represented and told that people of my race were what made the history and the foundation of outdoor adventure. So those are some of the privileges that I have. Okay? And I could do the same thing on gender, I could do it on sexual orientation, gender identity, anything, you know. There's a certain unasked for but often invisible privilege that we carry around. So, so on a personal level, on the what now, is how, to, uh, how do you unpack that and how do you work with that in your group? Okay, and I'm going to give you, no, stay there. Um, so here's, here's an orientation. So how do you understand your group in order to do that? Here's an orientation group. This was taken when we had orientation trips a few years ago. And they're just ready to go out on a backpacking trip. It's first day, so they still are clean. Um, and uh, when you look at this photo of this outdoor orientation group, we're conditioned to look at some commonalities there. Uh, it's kind of, you know, your typical group. They're a little apprehensive. Um, they're just some kids trying to get oriented to college. Um, and we sort of ask ourselves as leaders, you know, what am I going to do to get them safely through this experience so they enjoy it and they bond and they, you know, fulfill the goals of our trip. <clears throat> but what I'm going to suggest to you is that you change your perspective. And so let's do this little perspective exercise. Maybe there's like four of you in this room that have never done it before, but we're still going to do it anyway, and I might be wrong. Okay, so the perspective exercise is you take a finger, so you all have to have a finger up, okay? And I, I, I put my finger down here around my waist, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to move my finger clockwise, okay? Moving my finger clockwise. Now look at that finger clockwise, okay? Now what I want you to do is keep moving the finger clockwise, and I want you to put it above your head. Now, which way is it moving? Uh, what? Counterclockwise. Somebody said counterclockwise. Does anyone else having the same experience? So uh, you can stop now uh, once you figure out where it goes. You can, you can make it go down again. And it'll switch again. Okay. Why did it switch? <laughs> what? Perspective. Your perspective. You're looking at it in a different way. What I'm going to urge you to do is look at this group in a different way. All right? You can use that one. How many people didn't know that? More than four. Okay, good. Shoo. Okay. And look at this group in a different way. And, and I'll, get to the, I'll get to the point of this in just a second. So when I look at this group now in my different, in my different perspective up here, I'm going to realize that someone is genderqueer or transgender in this group. I'm going to believe that someone has an eating disorder. I'm going to believe that someone has Asperger's syndrome or other, autism spe other places on the autism spectrum. I'm going to believe that someone is Jewish. I'm going to believe that someone is gay, lesbian, or bisexual. I'm going to believe that someone was raised in a poor family. I'm going to believe that someone's racial identity is important. Okay? I'm going to believe a lot that a lot of the oppressions that we experience in society are in that group. Now, I'm not going to try to pick out who's who yet, um, or, or at all. I didn't mean yet. Um, Okay? And what we call this is radical inclusion. 
And uh, apologies to Burning Man, because they actually started this whole thing. But, um, but radical inclusion. It's the idea that everyone's on the trip, that all identities already are on your trip. Because what we often do on outdoor trips and outdoor adventure is we wait until we find out if those identities, and then we change our behavior to respond to those identities. Right? OK? What I'm going to suggest is change your perspective and come in and say those identities are here. I'm not sure all of them are, but believe that they all are here. And change your trip so each of those identities is accommodated, is respected, and is celebrated. Okay? That's radical inclusion, that everyone is always on the trip. Okay. All right. Um, I've unpacked, I've done that. Okay. So a couple last things to think about is in, in terms of critical thinking is, to, uh, is to how do you unpack your program. What I would encourage all of you is to go from here, get with your peeps, and talk about what it is that are these hidden things, because they're, they're often hidden, okay? It won't be a comfortable conversation. There'll be lots of denial, okay? Because that's, what that's what we've learned. We're not bad people, because we've learned that. But, so it's not our fault, I always tell my students, it's not our fault, but it is our responsibility. And as Alice Walker says, it's our responsibility because we live here, we live with people. And you're in a position where you're working with people um, who are depending on you to have a perspective that their identity is important, whatever it is, okay? <clears throat> so, some things that you might think about doing. And this was the paradigm of individualism and how to co-create uh, co trips. You might consider having identity-based trips, okay? Not just, not just people of color, you know, queer trips, um, uh, you know, the, the whole range of uh, accessible trips. Uh, you can't use, you usually don't do age. Um, <laughs> I do that on all my trips. <laughs> I'm a representative. So identity-based trips, okay? And people go, oh, no, we can't do identity because that is this exclusive, uh, okay? That's what, that's what you'll get, okay? Expect whenever you do anything like this that you're going to get feedback, and that feedback is often, is often termed backlash in my mind, <laughs> okay? So you're going to get backlash. So it's, it's about creating the experience um, and expecting the backlash and figuring out ahead of time how to deal with it, okay? And this gets to what Brett was talking about. When you're creating identity-based trips, you need to work with those components on your campus, those, those offices on your campus that are involved in identity culture, okay? So I go to the Queer Center and we co-create a queer trip, okay? And I go to a cultural center and we co-create a, a trip for women of color or, you know, I've had different ones, women of color, um, people of color, um, um, I did one with the Latino sisters, you know, the, um, so different ones. You know, I have to work across, you know, campus in order to do that. It, it, it would be very privileged for me as a white person to go, hey, I'm going to lead a people of color trip, you all come, right? It's that paradigm again. You all come, we're going to do this. Even though I'm super sensitive, right? Um, we're going to do this, and um, we're going to kind of do my trip, okay? So it's co-creation. Enough said. Um, I forget what this one's about. Oh, yeah, I don't. So <laughs> that was a trip we just did on the Connecticut this fall. <laughs> You know, it looks like the coast of Maine. <laughs> so how do you come out of the fog? I knew there was a metaphor here somewhere. <laughs> how do you come out of the fo fog? One way to come out of the fog is using ally behavior. And ally behavior <clears throat> is uh, being advocates for people that experience marginalization, that experience oppression. And being an ally means you're being an ally because you believe that that will create justice. You're not doing it for yourself, 
okay? People who are allies for yourself are usually pretty ineffective. I had a student that just told me um, the other day, she said, um, she said, I was with uh, a group of people and someone came up to me and said, I'm really, want, I'm really your ally and I really want to be your ally, but how you're talking um, is making it really hard for me, okay? So this was all about them. This is allies for themselves, not for the kind of re reinventing our system of justice, really. Okay. So one of the things that I use, and we're not going to do this here, but if you come to some other workshops, we'll play, do this. Um, we actually have cross-ally or cross-group dialogue. So I have uh, people who are a marginalized group sit on one side of the room, while people in, uh, what did I say, marginalized people in the target group or the... Uh, Privileged groups sit on the other side of, you know, facing each other. And they, we ask each other, I need you to be an ally to me. Bye. And I say something that's important to me. And then the other person answers, I can be an ally to you. Bye. Okay. So um, let me give an example. So if I'm sitting here, um, um, which identity should I choose? Um, if I'm sitting here as a lesbian, and I ask people to, you know, to really don't just play the game. It's really about who your identity is, your real identity. And I say, I need you to be an ally to me by realizing that um, um, don't, make, don't make the assumption that when I say I have children that I'm married to a man. Okay? And as your ally, you could say to me, um, I can be your ally by realizing that there's lots of different kinds of families. Okay, so that's an example. Okay, so some other, and I think I'm running out of what is, oh, training and practice. This is where you get to hear me play. Okay. All right, so I'm going to play you a uh, social justice song. Here we go. Ready? How was it? You're really kind because it wasn't good. <laughs> wasn't good at all. Okay? Because I have no training on this flute. And I have not practiced one iota on this flute. Social justice is a lot of times people, well-intentioned people, like, I'm really a great person. I really believe in all this stuff. But unless you practice and unless you do training on it, you're not going to get better at it because it's so subtle, it's so slippery, okay? So if you're just like, I'm a good person, I'm a well-intentioned person, you're me with this flute, okay? You can do, be you can do better. How many people do social justice training in, in, in your um, orientation, outdoor orientation program training, okay? And I'm not trying to like say, oh, you're great and we're not and all that sort of things. Because a lot of times what you get from people is we don't have time to do it. Okay? And what's the message that you give when you say we don't have time to do it is, oops, it's not important. Okay? So, um, and a lot of times we don't do it because we don't know how to do it. And a lot of times we do it because we're not to the brave space. We don't do it because we're not in brave space. We're like, that's going to be too uncomfortable. So it's easy, you know. And I'm sitting up here, I'm just like, you know, lecturing to you, da, 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 da. I mean, it happens to me all the time. So I'm, I'm in my office yesterday, and I walk to the bathroom, and there's this woman sitting there um, at the front desk, and she's wearing this sweatshirt that says, JB's school, I mean, James Baldwin's school, outward bound. It has an outward bound symbol. Well, I was an outward bound instructor, so I like immediately gravitate to the outward bound symbol. I go, oh, you did this program? So we're talking about it. It was out um, um, New York outward bound school, and we're talking about it, da-da-da-da-da. And so then I go into the bathroom, and I'm in the bathroom, and I'm going, I should talk to her about, um, you know, because uh, I've been trying to work out a, a program with the cultural center, I should talk to her about this program with the cultural center and, um, you know, see if she's interested. In and I'm sitting there going, I'm in the bathroom, I'm sitting there <laughs> going, oh, no, i got to get back and write the speech. Oh, no, uh, you know, that's going to be a little awkward for her. And who's it really going to be awkward for? Um, and so I'm sitting there going, oh, no, 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 no. And I had all these reasons not to do it to go back and talk to her about, you know, this program that I was thinking about. And I sat there long enough, and I said, 
this is just distancing behavior. This, I'm just, you know, not going to do this because it's uncomfortable. And so once I had identified that in myself, I did go out there and very uncomfortably talk about um, the program with her. And, and, and so, I, you know, it wasn't a huge success, but um, that's often why we don't do training and practice because of the uncomfortable. Okay, I'm leaving room. Last slide, which is let's talk. Um, and it doesn't say questions, because questions I think are a privileged concept where you ask me, the, you know, the whatever audience, ask the expert, I hate that word. Um, okay, so let's talk. Yeah. I was just thinking about the supply versus utility. I guess in my mind, I'm a little skeptical that sublime is kind of a, a white privilege thing. Mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, uh, do we have an indigenous nations park system where things that are valuable to indigenous people are? In a way, there's, there's a, like, have you heard of the Badger Tree Medicine? I'm sorry? Have you heard of the Badger Tree Medicine? Badger? Yeah, it's, it's like right next to Glacier National Park. Uh -huh. And um, it's, it was leased for oil drilling, but they recently preserved it under a it was like a, a cultural heritage site. Uh-huh, there is a cultural heritage act. All, all I'm trying to say is that you're be, being provocative about it. We have this whole national park system, which is, you know, because we have white people representative in Congress and in our government that is able to do that and historically able to do it, any indigenous sites that I know of have always been preserved under conflict. Okay? Yeah, under conflict, you know. It, it was hard, you know. Okay, so that's kind of what I, you know, see that. Now, you know, we all see beauty in things. And all of these things, I'm not saying they're wrong. Um, I'm saying, how do we look at them from a different lens? Okay. Uh, the National Park is this. I think this is like, and again, if I gave my own unconscious privilege, um, when I learned that the National Parks were segregated at all, and if they weren't fully totally desegregated until after the Civil War, and then Mm -hmm. in 1964, uh -huh. which is, I remember that being a very, like, hard for the fact that they uh -huh. Yeah, and there's some historians, I mean, even to piggyback on that, that would suggest that um, even our whole concept of wilderness was created to justify the, annihil the annihilation of a people, to justify genocide of, of Native Americans here. Um, because if, if these were places that we wanted on trample or whatever, then we needed to move people out of them. Yeah, Scott? Uh, Karen, one thing I, I'd be curious to hear about other people in your program, but one thing I've noticed over the years is that we do a really nice job of diversity in the welcoming part. So our program, our first year, is very diverse. But when we go to the next day, leaders, it drops off drastically. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering if other people have dealt with that, have seen that phenomenon, and what they do to maybe help because it is like that, open up the you know, catalog, I don't see myself. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You were asking other people, any, anybody? I guess it's just a no, you know, I think, it, you know, I just had an email yesterday from this woman, some college, is doing her doctoral work on um, how women are non-existent, you know, not non-existent, are not so existent in upper um, leadership positions in outdoor education. And, you know, she was, you know, her, she wants her PhD dissertation to be on, you know, asking questions where, where at middle management do women slip out of outdoor education and why, okay? And, uh, 
Um, you know, I just don't think it's just something that just happened, right? I think there's, there's real reasons. And so why do uh, people of color, if that's who you mean, are slipping out of leadership positions? I mean, I, you know, there's, there's sure lots of reasons in terms of, um, you know, if you went to the cultural center and asked them, you yeah. know. Well, I guess my question is, uh, how, how much does the leadership management program provide to the, uh, the co-creation of uh, what's important about leadership for people with disabilities? So there is a sort of singular question that makes leadership leadership, and that's very important. I would like to argue. So I guess maybe I would, I would think that it could have been something to not talk about. You put down the idea of like the trip was great, but it doesn't really resonate. It doesn't, there's nothing in it for me that's going to keep me coming back. Um, so maybe that, that's a place to look. And you can look at some of the stuff that Jory did earlier on racial identity development, because at that age, the, 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 um, the conflict, if you will, between um, white people going through white racial identity development and black people going through um, black racial identity development really creates some real um, conflict. Um, because um, as, as he was talking about, uh, often after American, and it's, it's called black racial identity. So um, black people want to be with um, folks that are like them, okay? And white people uh, that are becoming very open-minded want to be with black folks. But the black folks don't want to be with white folks because, and you know, there's the classic book, Why Are, we all, why are all the Blacks Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Well, it's racial identity development. That could be part of it. There's lots of things. Yeah, Rick. Yeah, and I just, I go, you're not alone. I think everybody in the room is in that same place. I don't know if we have any answers. I think that's why, if you get a response, but, you know, you know I think your, your point is, you know, a good way to ask this question, and I don't have any answer for it, is um, what is the difference between the orientation program that, that does bring in a more diverse what message is going out about that where a more diverse group wants to be a part of it that doesn't exist around the leader training program? Because that's clearly something that just does not happen. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do we get to that message? And I guess we want to go back to rad radical inclusion because oftentimes, especially in this field, one of the things I notice is we just go to race, okay? And if we, um, and oppressions are, are, you know, we know intersectionality, oppressions are linked, okay? So, you know, we need to also ask the question, are we, you know, are we getting our transgender leaders here? Are we getting our, um, you know, woman leaders, you know, all those other things. So I just want to keep that in the dialogue too, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think we've talked the same thing and we've talked a lot with our, we very recently in the book, we saw that our leadership board didn't necessarily represent people who were coming on our first team when they were optional. And one of the things we found by talking to some of our international students that were leaders, which is kind of one of our other populations, we said, hey, you want to have more representative, broadly speaking, it's a very different experience from international students um, than the domestic students, is that by talking with the handful of, you know, two or three in the whole program we've had, they said, you know, I, I'm really happy I did it. So it's amazing how I'm a leader. But before I made the decision to come in and do the interview and fill up the application all the rest of it, I just didn't think I'd be able to qualify to do it. Because anyone that told me, oh yeah, you can do this, even though the application said no experience required on the rest of it, there was a there's a little bit of a communication of this that between like, hey, like I, you know, one of my good friends of leaders is, is a, a guy from India. And he was like, yeah, like, I've never been candidate part of this program, and unless my leader hadn't come to me and said, you are totally qualified to be a leader. You're a really nice guy. You should give it a try. I would have completely thought I was, you know, didn't meet the baseline criteria, just you know, in a self-doubt kind of way. Mm -hmm. And so we started talking about ways that we can work using our existing here now, but also just work with like cultural organizations to say, like, hey, like, you know, you really, everyone really has the ability to start. You don't need some, you know, pretty proper. You don't need some minimum baseline, whatever it is. Um, and mm -hmm. trying to find a way that we could be better about messing that into. You know, what we saw in the is once we got one or two, or the openly queer students or openly trans students, once we got one or two that were very um, excited about their position, felt very secure in their place organization, it became what that's an issue. You could see, you could see yourself in some passive or something like that. Mm -hmm. We're trying to figure out yeah. ways yeah. around that exact kind of thing. Great. One more because I think we do have to move on because there's workshops, right? Did they start pretty soon here? Yeah, but go ahead. I'm just reminded of a, uh, a major cultural issue that happened in our I want to say that a friend from the organization denied the right for certain people to be here. 
based on their oral teaching mm -hmm. and require people who are hiring the people to ask the questions. Mm -hmm. That demographic, we're now seeing those leaders become college students or those children from those leaders become college students. And I wonder the impact that that decision and that conversation made had on more people, more transgender, more cultural differences, more people becoming leaders. Mm -hmm. couldn't ask people if they didn't feel it had any bearing on their leadership. And so I'm listening to the conversation and wonder what impact that had on young people if they're moving to their generation to do this now. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all. And I just, you know, just go out. If you go out with anything, go out with Alice Walker who says, you know, activism is the rent you pay for living on this planet.